Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. My idea for this show was to invite guests and get the conversation started, to take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. And we encourage our listeners to look within themselves to take decisive action to make a positive difference. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers. And today uh, I decided to do a little bit of a shift, a priority shift, because something was weighing on my heart pretty heavy. Um, and that was the moment that we are in with regards to um, the election process in the United States of America. And so I spoke with my previously uh, lined up guest, uh, James Bradley Jr. And we he was very amenable to rescheduling that interview. And I'm grateful for that. And please tune back in because he's an amazing, legendary musician with the Chuck Mangione uh, Quartet. Um, and I'm looking forward to bringing him back. However, today, what was on my heart was the idea of the moment that we are in and this election. And I could not help but think that this being the last show prior to the election, that there was something else that I was being called to take a look at. And that is this election process itself. And I thought it would be a good idea there's so much emphasis on the voting and all of that. I thought it would be a good idea to visit and take a look at how our voting rights came to be. I mean, when this nation began, what was the idea of voting and how did it evolve over time? So I'm going to take a dive into that before I introduce my guest for today. But before I do that, I would like to share a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which I think speaks to this very moment. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted by the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. And perhaps it's the sentiment of that quote that um, caused me such unrest last night. And so I decided to switch gears. But so I, I would like to take a look at the voting process from the beginning to the current day so that we can all understand because I didn't fully grasp these facts. And I thought, well, if I'm going to look at it, I might as well share this information with all of you as well. So in 1776, voting looked like this. Only people who own land can vote. Um, and then the Declaration of Independence was signed the right to vote during the colonial and revolutionary periods is restricted to property owners. Most of them are white male Protestants over the age of 21. So only a select few were able to vote during that time. In 1787, no federal voting standard uh, and states could decide who could vote according to the United States Constitution that was adopted because there is no agreement on a national standard for voting rights. States are given the power to regulate their own voting laws. In most cases, voting remains in the hands of white male landowners. In 1789, George Washington was elected president. Only 6% of the population can vote at that time. In 1790, 
citizen, which equaled white. 1790 naturalization law was passed. It explicitly states that only free white immigrants can become naturalized citizens. In 1848, activists for ending slavery and women's rights joined together and women's rights uh, uh, for a women's rights convention held in Seneca Falls, New York. Frederick Douglass, a newspaper editor and former slave, attends the event and gives us a, a speech supporting universal voting rights. His speech helps convince the convention to adopt a resolution calling for voting rights for women. In 1848, citizenship granted, but voting denied the Treaty of Guadalupe. Hidalgo ends the Mexican-American War and guarantees U.S. citizenship to Mexicans living in the territories conquered by the U.S. However, English language requirements and violent intimidation limit access to voting rights. 1856, the vote expanded to all white men. North Carolina is the last state to remove property ownership as a requirement to voting. 1866, movements unite and divide. Two women's rights activists, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, form an organization for white and black women and men dedicated to the goal of universal voting rights. The organization later divides and regroups over disagreements and strategies to gain the vote for women and African Americans. 1868, former slaves granted citizenship. The 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is passed. Citizenship is defined and granted to former slaves. Voters, however, are explicitly defined as male. Although the amendment forbids states from denying any rights of citizenship, voting regulation is still left in the hands of the states. 1870, the vote cannot be denied because of race explicitly, so other discriminatory tactics were used. The 15th Amendment passed. It states that the right to vote cannot be denied by the federal or state governments based on race. However, soon after, some states begin to enact measures such as voting taxes and literacy tests that restrict the actual ability of African Americans to register to vote. Violence and other intimidation tactics are also used. 1872, women try to vote. Susan B. Anthony is arrested and brought to trial in Rochester, New York for attempting to vote in the presidential election. At the same time, Sojourner Truth, a former slave and advocate for justice and equality, appears at a polling booth in Grand Rapids, Michigan, demanding a ballot, but she is turned away. 1876, indigenous people cannot vote. The Supreme Court rules that Native Americans are not citizens, as defined by the 14th Amendment, and thus cannot vote. 1882. The Chinese Exclusion Act bars people of Chinese ancestry from naturalizing to become U.S. citizens. 1887. The Right to Vote Dawes Act passed. Now, it grants citizenship to Native Americans who give up their tribal affiliations. 1890, Wyoming admitted to statehood and becomes the first state to legislate voting for women in its constitution. 1890, indigenous people must apply for citizenship. The Indian Naturalization Act grants citizenship to Native Americans whose applications are approved, similar to the process of immigrant naturalization. 1912-1913, women lead voting rights marches through New York and Washington, D.C. 1919, military service citizenship for Native Americans. 
you know, this is fascinating because as much as we look back into this past, we have echoes of this past actually occurring today during this election cycle as well. In 1920, the right to vote extended to women. The 19th Amendment passed, giving women right to vote in both state and federal elections. 1922, Supreme Court rules that people of Japanese heritage are ineligible to become naturalized citizens. In the next year, the court finds that Asian Indians are also not eligible to naturalize. 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act grants citizenship to Native Americans, but many states nonetheless make laws and policies which prohibit Native Americans from voting. 1925, Congress bars Filipinos from U.S. citizenship unless they have served three years in the Navy. 1926, while attempting to register to vote in Birmingham, Alabama, a group of African-American women are beaten by election officials. 1947, legal barriers to Native American voting is removed. 1952, all people of Asian ancestry are granted the right to become U.S. citizens. In 1961, the 23rd Amendment passed. It gives citizens of Washington, D.C. the right to vote for a U.S. president. But to this day, the district's residents, most of whom are African-American, still do not have voting representation in Congress. 1963, 1964, state officials refused to allow African-Americans to register by using voting taxes, literacy tests, and violent intimidation. 1964, the 24th Amendment is passed. It guarantees that the right to vote in federal elections will not be denied for failure to pay any tax. 1965, the Voting Rights Act passed. It forbids states from imposing discriminatory restrictions on who can vote and provides mechanisms for the federal government to enforce its provisions. The legislation is passed largely under pressure from protests and marches earlier that year, challenging Alabama officials who injured and killed people during African-American voter registration efforts. 1966, after the legal change, struggle continues for social change. Civil rights activist James Meredith is wounded by a sniper during a solo walk against fear voter registration march between Tennessee and Mississippi. The next day, nearly 4,000 African Americans registered to vote. In 1971, the voting age is lowered to, to 18. The 26th Amendment is passed, granting voting rights to 18 year olds. The amendment is largely a result of the Vietnam War protests, demanding a lowering of the voting age on the premise that people who are old enough to fight are old enough to vote. 1975, amendments to the Voting Rights Act require that certain voting materials be printed in languages besides English. In 1993, the National Voter Registration Act passed intends to increase the number of eligible citizens who register to vote by making registration available at the Department of Motor Vehicles, Public Assistance, and Disabilities Agencies. In 2000, residents of U.S. colonies are citizens, but cannot vote. Nearly 4.1 million people total cannot vote in presidential elections and do not have voting representation in the U.S. Congress. Nearly 4 million U.S. citizens cannot vote because of past felony convictions. Especially in the South, a person with a felony conviction is forever prohibited from voting in that state. These laws are a legacy of post-Civil War attempts to prevent African Americans from voting 
ex-felons are largely poor and people of color. 2002 Help America Vote Act, passed in response to disputed 2000 presidential election. Massive voting reform effort requires states to comply with federal mandate for provisional ballots, disability access, centralized computer voting lists, electronic voting, and requirement that first-time voters present identification before voting. In 2008, the top two primary is enacted, allowing voters to choose any candidate regardless of party preference. In 2009, Washington becomes the second state after Oregon to vote entirely by mail rather than in person and at the polls. I wanna thank Brant Ryan for doing some research and assisting me with pulling together these little factoids. And um, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful to him for that. So when we come back, I will introduce you to our guest for today. He is a very good friend of mine and a fellow clergyman who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, and he's a scholar and he's an author, and, and you'll get all that here in just a minute. But um, in a few moments, we will hear from the Reverend Dr. Winterborne Harrison Jones, and we're going to take a break so I can spell all of that out because it uses about every letter in the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're grateful to have him here with us. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires right here on the Inspired Choices Network. We'll be right back. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday. 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back, and you're listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and I'm your host, Bill Myers. And before we went to break, I was going to start the uh, introduction of my guest today, and um, so I will jump into that. But before I do, I want to reflect on a statement that was made in a previous show by the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, the uh, General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. And through the discussion and talking about racism in America and um 
and all of that, one of the things that he recommended out of the gate when it was, you know, when we discussed how do we get, how do we move forward from this? And we were talking about faith leaders. And the first thing that he said was that I believe that all of the white guys, all of the white men have to take a seat on the back of this bus and need to open up and listen to uh, our African-American brothers and sisters to tell us and, and to help redeem us. And so I, I thought that, again, all of these things were sort of swirling into my head. So um, I wanted to, to address that today and to do that very thing where we let the floor, we, we open up the floor to the Reverend Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones. He is a scholar and author an ecclesial leader and distinguished churchman out of the lineage of Dr. William August Jones, Dr. James Forbes, Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, the Reverend Marvin Chandler, and Dr. Howard Thurman. A fifth-generation minister, Dr. Harrison Jones is widely sought after as a preacher, speaker, and workshop facilitator. Reverend Harrison Jones is a 2006 graduate of Theodore Roosevelt Senior High School in Washington, D.C., and a 2010 graduate of the historic Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he earned his bachelor's degree in religious and philosophical studies. While at Fisk, Reverend Harrison Jones had the distinct opportunity of being mentored by Fisk University President and former United States Secretary of Energy, the Honorable Hazel R. O'Leary, and Dean of the Historical Fisk Memorial Chapel, the Reverend Dr. Jason Richard Curry, PhD. I could go on and on with this bio, uh, but I am going to leave it right there. Suffice it to say, I am grateful to have the Reverend Dr. Harrison Jones with us today. So, Pastor Jones, I was just reflecting on the history of voting in the United States. And so hopefully we can we can derive from that uh, you can vote you can't vote you know that that sort of egg that keeps getting tossed back and forth which somewhat justifies completely the idea of the voter suppression tactics that continue to this very day that we're wrestling in courtrooms at this very moment. You know, some people, you know, again, may just completely take this for granted. And that's why I wanted to take a dive into the history of this. So there are great implications with the upcoming election. And I want to now turn to you and say, of that, of all of the chaos and, and, and whatnot going on, where do we go with this? The title of our show today is chaos and kairos and that was a result of the conversation that we had earlier so what i would like to do is give you the floor and and allow you to take it from there what does this election what are we facing as a nation well first let me say uh what a joy it is to be with you reverend myers and uh, i come to a friend and a brother thank you, uh, thank you. let me let me go back a, a bit to um that sort of beautiful uh and yet um, sort of eerie, if you will, timeline that you shared. Because oftentimes uh, there are populations in our nation um, that uh, perceive history as something distant. And we hear titles and, and times and dates, um, but because it does not or has not, we believe, uh, affected our sort of immediate um, uh, realm of, of, uh, of being, we sort of dismiss it. When we're talking about the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and today, this is a problem when it comes to voter suppression, uh, who uh, is seen uh, and affirmed as an American citizen and how power is uh, maintained in this nation. I wanna draw your attention uh, to one of the people who you named Dr. William Augustus Jones. He had a sermon once called the problem of the present past. And in that message, he talked about the danger of forgetting too quickly. And so I'm always amazed with people who sort of put this in the recess of their mind. Oh, that was then. No, this is now. And because we have not wrestled with it uh, intentionally, 
it has not in many instances become a part of our everyday vernacular. You know, we understand race and economics and poverty, but the power of the vote and how the vote has been manipulated, how the vote has been uh, benign, how populations continue to be suppressed, I think may be one of, uh, if not the greatest threat to whatever this idea of democracy is today. And so when you look up and we're battling the same isms as we were in the 1700s, the 1800s, the early 1900s, we have to ask ourselves, why is this? Here again in 2020, we have voter suppression that looks identical as it did at the beginning of the 18th, uh, the 19th and 20th centuries, the 21st centuries. Yes, yes. And, and this is America. Yeah. You know, and so when you add that to the system of racism, white supremacy, and how power is maintained and how populations continue to be marginalized, we see that this idea of suppression um, is interwoven into nearly every aspect, and I say nearly, but every aspect of our American culture. So this vote uh, and this election is crucial, but I would argue, Reverend Myers, not because of the people we are electing. And so there's so much uh, conversation, and yes, there um, certainly is a less favorable, depending on who you are or what you have to maintain, right. um, person in power, but more importantly, when you look at a nation that professes to be democratic and professes in its founding documents that all men, excluding women and blacks, are created equal, when you have this sort of American myth of prosperity and access for all, and you lay that at the feet of the population, the election uh, is even more important when you understand who's voting, why are they not voting, and the tactics that the system uses to keep certain populations' voices from being heard. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the election is important, not only because of what is at stake, depending on my personal values, um, mm -hmm. but also um, what will America be? So I think that this idea of kairos and, and chaos, this kairos being a a word out of uh, theology that means God's timing. When you look at what's happening in the world, large uh, numbers of protests, um, you have the spirit of Pentecost, if you will, of unrest. There is something within the American um, spirit that has been shaken and is coming alive. For me, the election is but a part of this larger story of what is happening in our nation and around the world, where we see marginalized populations taking their, their voices, their agency, their power, and saying there has to be a different way. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in America is the same thing happening in Rwanda. It's the same thing happening in South Africa. It's the same thing that has happened in different episodes throughout American history. The people, the masses of people are coming out to say, this is not how we envision our future. And they are using the power of the vote and the voice to make that known. Now, for me, I would not care who the candidates are when you think about it broadly. More importantly, I am listening oftentimes uh, with great frustration mm -hmm. to the rhetoric that is being used. How, how are we as a nation articulating our core values? What do we believe? What is our credo? What do we believe about human rights, human sexuality, peace, love, justice? And for me, the vote is how we, the masses, exercise our agency and let the world know that, yes, this is who we are, but no, this is who we are not. Mm. So for me, voting, whether you are pro or con, you're exercising some right. But more importantly, those who do not vote and what not participating in the democratic process does it maintains and it solidifies, it cements our future in a way that I'm not sure we all are on the same page as to um, the detrimental effects, if you will, of not being a part of this process. So the election is crucial, depending on your values. But more importantly, um, I am looking intently at how the American population is responding to this Kairos moment. We have been here before. 
This is not the first time we have been at the crossroads of justice and inequality. Uh, and this is not the first time when we have had much at stake. But I'm looking and I'm searching not only to see those who defend uh, whatever they perceive their, their, their rights or values to be, mm -hmm. but those who do not participate and um, leave it to uh, others to dictate what their future may be. Mm. Yeah, that's you said it. You said it, and that is that is a significant concern to me as well. And perhaps that is what uh, had me pretty restless last night, and really wrestling with the show that needs to happen today. Of course, this is the final show that I will have prior to the election, and so I felt that there was something that needed to be said. Uh, there was something that needed to be viewed regarding this election it's it's very interesting because you know as well that that i'm a musician and all of that and so over the last week or so the city of indianapolis has hired uh musicians to set up outside of the city county building where the elections the early um voting processes have been taking place so these lines are you know two and a half, three hours long and snaking all the way around. But there was something I, I so I wound up playing for that uh, occasion as many musicians are sort of uh, moving in. And I was just uh, struck by the fact that this line never went away. And it has been, that line has been in place for days, days, days. And, um, and so, you you had a sense of real commitment. You had a sense that people were there on purpose. Um, the music sort of helps ease the, you know, the process, you know, when you can tap your toes and go through a two and a half, three hour line. Uh, and I was grateful to participate in that and also to witness, again, to witness that commitment of many others. And again, but you the question you raise is 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 uh yeah, who, who knows what is in the minds of each one of these individuals as far as what, which America are you looking at? Which America are you choosing? You know, this is, you know, Dr. King's reference to the two Americas. I, um, and that seems to be what is perhaps on the ballot. You know what I mean? It, it, I mean, you know, regardless yeah, of whatever that's, way you go with this. That's what we're voting for. We are voting for the future of the nation. The, the candidates are problematic in many ways. Uh, they all have records and legacies of uh, uh, things that have um, come into uh, ill repute, if you will, okay. the, uh, during the election. Uh, again, based on my preferences, some more than others. But more importantly, is this idea of what will our future be? And I don't speak now as sort of uh, eschatologically, so, sort of distant, but, but Literally, the fabric of our nation is on the ballot. And how we envision, so Walter Brueggemann um, uh, wrote a piece, uh, I think his most famous piece called The Prophetic Imagination, mm -hmm. where he says as part of that writing that the most dangerous um, threat to any empire is the prophet, is the visionary. Those are the things that I am hoping are being um, nurtured and unearthed in this moment. I, I am very happy about the, the uh, record number of voting turnout, but I also recognize the, 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 the uh, games that have been played with the US Postal Service and the obstacles that have been put in place for people to vote. But this idea of catharsis that you speak of, of resilience, people who have stood in line. Now you said two or three hours, I, I, I wish, but I've heard six, seven, eight. Oh yeah. Hours. You oh, know, yeah. I, even here at our church, as you know, we are a polling site next Tuesday and we've had calls nonstop from elderly people who cannot stand in those long lines, but who feel the, uh, to use the words of Dr. King, that fierce urgency that they cannot let this moment pass. Why? Because the future of the nation, who we are as a people, as a community, uh, not that we all must agree, right? But that, but that there is some vision uh, that differs from our current state of being. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, and then there are those on the opposite side who are maintaining their right. You know, very. Uh, 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 I'll leave that alone. 
but but they they are they. <laughs> I, I, I digress, you see. <laughs> but, uh, but but I I I too have have listened to rhetoric, right, on both sides, uh, and uh, I ask myself, uh, sort of from a human development perspective, um, where have these where have these people come from? In, in what context have they been nurtured? And I speak not now against race uh, or, or other particular race of people, but when I hear people speak um, and they do not possess any ideals towards equality at all or human rights, that their, their sense of self, their sense of community does not extend beyond themselves. I, I wonder uh, how do they move throughout the world? How do they understand themselves and the other? And have we done such a, um, who are these people that, that have been incubated and nurtured within the belly of America? They belong to us. We cannot dispel them. Mm -hmm. but, but, but how do they understand this idea of community? Or how is it possible for a human to live in such a uh, detached and disdained way that they feel no obligation whatsoever to another human being? That that is a scare. That is scary, Reverend Myers. Yeah. And so that for me is what uh, I saw. That one political party uh, had a rally the other day, and bust people in to that rally. And uh, once that particular candidate left that rally, that thousands of people were left in the freezing cold. Many elderly. Um, for me, that is not a political issue. Yeah, we can sort of blame a party or an elephant or a donkey, but you know, whatever. But more importantly, how do you operate? <laughs> you know, who does that? You know, as my as my kids would say, what's wrong with you? Right. <laughs> you know, how, how is that possible? Right, right. To live in such a way that one feels no obligation. So the vote for me, Reverend Myers, is a is a tool uh, that uh, by which we exercise our sense of community, our sense of unity, our sense of obligation to the nation. But then also, I would argue, as we talked earlier this morning, that the vote is one of many. So while the election is important, um, civic engagement broadly, again, what and how are we shaping the nation? How are we shaping our children, our families, care for the elderly, volunteerism, community service, all of these things. When I say that we are in a Kairos moment, I mean that we are as a nation at a breaking point that we have lost in this age uh, many what I would call torchbearers, and I could call many names, uh, who have fallen to sleep, or in Christian words, have gone on to be a part of the, uh, the church triumphant. They've gone from the church militant to the church triumphant. But, but and so, the, so then, as God the Teller would say, the plot thickens, the chasm widens, because now it's you and I. Yeah. And how are we exercising that right as American citizens, as sisters and brothers, as part of the human family, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call yourself, we're here on this globe. I mean, we're global, we're global cohabitants. I mean, for those who, you know, who want to speak sort of broadly, esoterically, but but what what how, what and how are we shaping the world? And for me, that is a conversation that I wish we would be having now, right? Uh, along with this conversation on the vote, because our Tuesday will come and go. In American history, many Tuesdays have come and gone for election right. days. Um, some stolen, some rightfully won. Uh, and uh, history has yet to decide uh, uh, or to bleed all the secrets of, of the outcomes of, of them all. But right. more importantly, Wednesday comes. Right. It's like, the, it's like the day after the protest. Okay, so we protest. All right. So then there's the next day. And then this next day, so how do we live out that creed? Mm -hmm. If this is what we believe, then, then when Tuesday comes and goes, when the vote comes and goes, how are we exercising this 365 days? And let me say this, uh, since I'm here, that, that the, the, the um, basis for your work, I think is a part of our way forward. Beginning this conversation, um, bringing people um, from quote unquote opposite points of views and creating space where, where I'm, I'm not trying to indoctrinate you or to proselytize you, 
but but where we are able to at least as as humans envision a better tomorrow is this is there some creed we can shape right beyond our barriers of difference or indifference that will allow us to leave this world in some way better than we first found it uh, that's you know that's a you're on it and and I want to take a dive and and a little peek into what that might look like uh, in in this next segment. So we're going to take a break right now. And you are listening to Bill Myers Inspires with my guest today, the Reverend Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones. And we're discussing chaos and Kairos, the status of the current election process here in America and moving forward from here. We'll be right back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives. From our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and I'm here with my guest today, the Reverend Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones. And we were just discussing the the implications and perhaps consequences um, of moving forward. What happens after this election? How do we show up as a nation? How do we show up as people when we make this decision of what this nation wants to be moving forward? So we were just talking about this um, before the break, and now I want us to dive a little deeper into the moving forward. But before we do, I just want to make this point, Dr. Jones, and it is um, the continued distress, and by no means am I trying to step into addressing the the political nature necessarily or the occupant of the White House. I don't just I, I'm not trying to become political, but what I am trying to say is the slogan that has been adopted and has been run out there about make America great again. As I view this here document of voting rights from from the beginning and in the beginning there was voting. Okay. So when I look at this, I'm trying to find out where that stellar period was. Was it 1873, 18? What, what did I, did I, did I skip something? Because the, the America great again thing is a dream that is yet to be realized. It's at least in my lifetime, which is about a quarter of the nation's history so far, <laughs> you know, and I'm going, I've lived through some of that and my great grandmama was, you know, first generation free. I knew her. She was educated by, you know, uh, uh, George Washington Carver and, and Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute. That's where she married my great grandfather. So, so I'm going. What, what account? What unaccounted period are we referring to? When everything was, you know, people singing and dancing in the streets. Um, so I, I, I just want to start 
with that statement. Now we can move forward, but I just want to want you to understand how that has always felt somewhat nightmarish to me because I cannot identify said period when things were uh, good and good for whom and good for whom. I, I read a piece that uh, that I had uh, had sent myself uh, a couple of years ago. And I happened to come across it last night, and it's it was a piece dealing with wealth in a, in America, and it said at the current rate that we are going, and pro, you know blacks have really progressed. Okay, at the current rate that we are going, it would be two hundred and twenty eight years for a black person to rise to the level of where white people are in this nation right. Now, 228 years. I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait that long. I'm actually far more inspired to see uh, change and, and, and something occur in this lifetime. That at least when I draw my last breath, I might have a clue that I did leave something behind or uh, stood for something, you know, or pushed that needle some kind of direction one way or another. But just to sit back for 228 years which is pretty much the shelf life of this nation thus far. Uh, it's going to take us two, two Americas to finally get to where one should have been. So anyway. No, I, it, it, I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, Reverend Myers. <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to step over that puddle. But what I will say, <laughs> what I will say is that I too join you. Uh, I, I've, I've gone through my bookshelf to, to search for some missing chapter in this. Uh, <laughs> you know, I pulled out uh, 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 John Hope Franklin's. Uh, maybe he missed a chapter somewhere. Where, you know, but but the the seriousness of this is that uh, there are those who really do believe. See, underneath every date and time that you read was some mm. population who worked hard to maintain the status quo because it was their right. It is my right to own US property. It is my right to strip you of citizenship. It is my right to maintain power. And so when we talk about, again, the system of oppression, systems are maintained. And as I often tell my class that I teach at uh, IUPUI is that um, systems do not just fall apart. They must be abolished. And when you talk about uh, inequality, racial inequality or voter suppression in America, there was never a time in this nation. And as you and I have talked about, mm -hmm. in order to fix that problem, you got to go back to the beginning and tear the whole thing down and start over again. And that is what Kairos invites us to do. Mm -hmm. Kairos invites us not to put a Band-Aid on it, not to put a Sharpie on it, but to look at the problem. How do we solve this problem? What mountains must be moved? What hard conversations must be had? And more importantly, not who must give up power, but how do the masses demand, again, the masses again demand that this is not how we envision our future. This week in class, I had my students listen to two pieces. Uh, and I asked them to read them first before they listened to them. One was Gil Scott Heron's B movie. Okay. And one was uh, Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn. Mm -hmm. And they immediately drew uh, lines of similarity between the ethos and the, the themes of both. But Nina has this cadence about go slow. Emancipation, go slow. Uh, liberation, go slow. And, and, and so this idea of, of, of putting off uh, the work to another age. And those in power say, you know what? I think you've had enough of this age. We'll, 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 we'll pick this back up again. So again, what's happening in the streets, Reverend Myers, I think is so um, empowering to me. Though I'm searching for a more cohesive um, uh, agenda, mm -hmm. I am excited about uh, the ways in which it seems to me the resilience that 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 fire that I would call in my religious tradition of, of Pentecost is coming mm -hmm. alive in the hearts of of the nation. 
And again, Brueggemann's piece on prophetic imagination, what do you envision when John says that I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the new heaven and the new earth, uh, the old heaven, new earth, uh, old earth had passed away. And, and then behold, he created something, God created something new. What does human relations look like? Freedom of expression, uh, freedom of speech, uh, the right to love, the right to be. These, these are the things that, that are not only on the ballot on Tuesday, but these are the things that belong to this age of our stewardship of this planet Earth. I, want, I do wanna share something with you. I, I jotted down during the break. When you asked uh, about uh, what do we envision? And I'm going to see if I, I have a double screen, so it's blocked behind the Zoom, but let me um, pull this up. Langston Hughes wrote a poem in, uh, let's see if the year is attached to this. Uh, I do not see the year, but uh, he lived from 1902 to 1967. So somewhere between uh, uh, those dates called I Dream a World. And here is what uh, Hughes said. I dream a world where man, I dream a world where man, no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its path adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer steps the soul, nor blights our day. I dream a world where black and white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free, where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the need of all mankind. Of such I dream my world. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, and and you know, it it of course harkens and and reminds us also of Dr. King's "I Have a Dream," I'm, and which I'm sure was probably inspired by Langston Hughes and that that piece. Um, you know, it's it's love that we're after here. You know, I, I want to break ranks here because I think that. Uh, with that wonderful poem, and I want to revisit very quickly our quote that I began this program with, and then I'm going to ask you for a special request here in just a minute. Again, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for apathy or complacency. This is the time for vigorous and positive action. Once again, I just want to remind and bring that thing full circle. But before we get off uh, the air here, I would like to request that you, uh, Dr. Jones, might offer a prayer for this nation and, and this time that we are all in. And you've got uh, you've got about <laughs> not the Baptist prayer, bro. <laughs> Let's lean into that Presbyterian prayer, okay? <laughs> Let us pray. God of light and love, we honor your presence this day, and we thank you for the gift of life and for your subtle reminders to us that you are still in control. Oh God, as we stand at the intersection of chaos and Kairos, charge our hands and open our ears and our hearts that we may sense and hear and see and respond faithfully. For those who cling to the virtues of justice and mercy and peace, Oh God, may we stand boldly in the tradition of Deborah and Esther and Jeremiah and Isaiah. When your voice called out, oh God, who shall I send and who will go for us? Allow us in our head and our hearts to respond as Isaiah and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Amen. God, let us go together, walk hand in hand inspire our hearts and guide us always. May the fire of Pentecost burn within us and may we, O oh God, be a part of building your vision for a better world. Amen.
We ask you to roll with the punches. Thank you for spending your afternoon right here with us at Bill Myers Inspires. Remember, we're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Inspired Choices Network. Remember to take time this week to take a breath and look within yourself and figure out how you can make a positive difference in this world. Spread the word, and we'll see you here next Friday. Have a wonderful week.